Good evening, and welcome to the spring lecture series of the Nolan School of Architecture. My name is Christy Ballier, I'm an assistant professor of architecture and the chair of this semester's lecture series entitled Mingle. I'll spare you the full definition, but this semester we are sure to have here lectures that mingle, that shift the states, that are nimble as they seek innovation across disciplines. I'd like to remind you this evening that as an academic lecture series, we will end this lecture with a Q&A, and we'd like to ask that everyone stay for the full duration of the lecture this evening. I'm going to turn over the mic to Jeffrey Kipnis, who will offer the introduction this evening to our lecturer, David Bradley. Excuse me, Benjamin Bradley. I think I had in mind that I'd like to remind you all of our second lecture next Wednesday with Daniel Barber, who's also not David. But I think the D was in my mind. I think perhaps it's good that Jeff is offering the introduction this evening. Thank you.
And two other things I think are interesting that have happened in the same time. Since that time, computers have arisen. 1973, no such thing. 1987, uh, they, they come around, they become the printing to own. The half the world doesn't get email until 1996. We went to the moon with 2000K, no, 2000K computer. So, uh, and the other thing I think you should know, hey, really, is that the population, how many of you know the population of Earth today? Raise your hand if you think you know the population. Okay, I find that incredibly interesting. Uh, when I was kind of your age, uh, you kind of knew the population because you wanted to get on Jeopardy. Yes. It would be it's going to be a question. And so when I was in high school, it was three billion. When I graduated from college, it was four billion. It's now seven billion. Uh, in forty years, it'll be nine point six billion. So when we run out of oil, the population of Earth will be nine point six billion people. The F the United Nations sixty five. Uh, by 65 estimate survey of the whole human population of Earth is somewhere between 8 billion and 14 billion, with the mean is 9.6 million. So just as we run out of oil, we will be at the whole human population of Earth, 9.6 billion. This is, this is your life. That's the name of the old TV show. Uh, also, computers came on, and computers, of course, we know primarily, most recently through Sony or Snowden, but also Big Data. You know? And so these three things are really interlinked, interlinked <coughs> primarily by petroleum and because of electricity. Computers, for example, use 2% of the petroleum resources in the world, but they produce 40% of the sorry, Electricity uses 2% of the petroleum resources in the world, but produce 40% of the pollution. 70% of the world's <coughs> population are fed by food that's grown with petroleum resources. So, so the fact, the use of computers, which you certainly like, the limited resources of petroleum, and the um, state of population, like you know, energy, population, data processing, and energy are interlinked now to form an entirely new world for you. When you were my age, just like it sort of started. And it's a reality. And I don't think it's a scary, it's a kind of neat reality. I don't think it's, you should be afraid of it. But I do think you should be aware of it. And I do think the funny thing is architecture is deeply implicated in it. It will be really good for business. Trust me. It may not be such an interesting business. It may not be the business we were talking about, had been talking about for the last 40 years, where you kind of study Italian styles and formalism. But it will be really an interesting business. <laughs> and so I've taken myself and some other colleagues of mine to want to take a look at this situation in the context of the way we've been teaching our kids. Not let's throw it all out, not let's quit doing it. But we need to start telling some new stories. We need to start getting. We need to join the students in helping them find some direction from where we are and how we teach today to where they're going and what their world is going to be like. And that's what this conference is about uh, Saturday. And it's actually not really a conference. It's more like a jam. It's a jam session with friends of mine that I've brought from around the world. And the fact that it's based on the fact that there's kind of convergence of people. So I really hope you'll come. Actually, I really hope you won't come. But you are invited since it's paid for by the school. And I must say something like, I really hope you'll come. And so that's it. You're all invited. It starts at the table. <laughs> 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 and it's somewhere in this building. <laughs> now, I want to introduce Benjamin Bradford. I've known Benjamin Bradford more than 10 years, probably less than 15 years. We were, we see each other. Over that period of time, we saw each other a lot. We would be at the same school. I would be, you know, he taught at UCLA, he was around Sire a lot. We were reviews a lot. We were friendly, but not friends. 
We were collegial, but not colleagues. He was the third or fourth generation of theorists to come in after, in, in the style of which I was the first generation. Read French structuralist theory, lots of, read everything but architecture, and pretend like that, do architecture. And, you know, it, it, kind of uh, tedium or suspicion about second, third, and fourth generation people come in and say, he was always impressive, I always liked him, but for almost a decade, I never quite understood where he was going with what he was talking about. You know, he, he got his PhD in the sociology of science. Uh, he knew, is that right, sociology of technology from UC Barber, at UC Barber? Uh, so we'd be on reviews together, he'd say a lot of interesting stuff, he'd quote a lot of interesting people, he read a lot of stuff. One thing you're going to find tonight, how the night is this guy reads a lot of stuff, and it all comes out in every sentence he says. I'm going to teach you how to listen to him in a second, once again. So uh, I didn't really know what to make him. I liked him, I liked to see him, he always had a big smile on his face, he kind of looks neat. And there's some other people around that, that were really horrible to be around. He was a of those. About 18 months ago, we were together on a conference, at a conference at Princeton where most of these people that are coming tomorrow came together. Um, and where I just started to get the bug about all this stuff. And it was a two-day conference, incredibly interesting. And it was a lot of big day. Uh, uh, some of the people, all the people that were here tomorrow said they made them go artist who I got very interested in, um, independent of any of these people, only to discover that she was in one of uh, Benjamin's classes when he was at uh, UCLA. And, and it's a, it's a student of his. He is now, by the way, the head of the fine arts department at uh, UC San Diego. Um, for two days there was this, this fantastic discussion of the internet, Snowden events, stuff, <laughs> and, and you know, it's a really incredible discussion of what the power of big data and big and you know, people from Google and hackers and all sorts of stuff like that. It's really amazing. And, but on the other hand, you'd hear this fantastic visionary understanding of the technology. And then when they would talk about the value structures or the way it might apply to our thinking about our lives. You would hear 19th century economic sociological models applied to it. Ideas like food. Because in order for us to protect our privacy, as if you've ever, as if you've had any privacy for the last 10 years. If, if any of you in this room imagined yourself having any privacy. And so rather than, and so they, there was this kind of fantasy on the one hand of the world that they thought they lived in, which was really based in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and this understanding of technology and the power of the web and technology beyond anybody thing I've ever seen before in my life. And for two days, I just got more and more and more frustrated and more and more and more excited. I didn't really know what to do. And then, of course, Benjamin's there, and I was like, hey, Benjamin, nice to see you again. And then, so and then it was his turn to speak. I thought, okay, let's hear what he does. I don't know what he's talking about, but it'll sound kind of neat. And then he gave this talk, and it was electrifying. And it was as if he'd been born onto Earth and has just been waiting around for this moment that arrived. That he had been born 15 years early, and this was his moment. And he had written this book, and I hope we can talk about it tonight. And he put the whole conference in perspective for me. Um, I think he was the only one who understood that that the technology of thinking, that the technology of world making, that the technology of values had to keep up with the technology that, of the performance of technology that the conference was about. And it was really a thrilling moment. And from that moment, I, literally that day, I said, I want you to come to the US theory founder at Ohio State. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of looks like America. You have come into your own. I'm, I'm, I've made a career out of hooking myself on the bandwagons of other talented people. Long, this is like my fourth 
cried more times past when I ever had anything in my own seconds. Uh, and, I, and that's why he's here. Now, how, just quickly, how to listen to Ben. He, uh, he knows a whole lot. He's read a whole lot. He is an honest person, so he gives credit to the people who he's read. And so he will mention their names, and, uh, as he should. And I don't because I can't really remember them anymore, and I'm not really sure if I got it right. So don't worry about it. If you don't know who Duluth or Weber or any of the people he makes, don't worry too much about it. That's what speaks with a kind of hypnotizing eloquence that becomes very easy to just get lost in. Uh, I, what, I was gonna let, I should have let Christy do the introduction. She had him as a teacher and she's she, she talked about how weird it was to have him teach. So here's, here's my lesson. I know you've watched Shakespeare plays in movies and on TV. And I know you know what it feels like for that 15 minutes where you just have to let yourself settle into the language. You have to relax. You have to quit trying to listen. You have to let yourself settle in. And finally, you get in rhythm and you get it. And if you'll just do this tonight, you will have the same epiphany that I did at Princeton. That's your job. Planetary scale computation 
as the primary culprit in this destabilization uh, of the old geopolitical order that act, non-state actors like Google, Facebook, uh, which all the Chinese cloud platforms and so forth and so on, had, had produced, a, had produced a, a world in which information flows, ones that we can see, ones that were part of, ones that happened at an infrastructure level beneath us in one way or another, somehow scramble the basic logic of petition and order uh, identity and sovereignty upon which this other apparatus uh, has, has, has construed. And I think this is basically true, but that the language and uh, models and ideas that we have to talk about this, to describe it, let alone to redesign it, re-engineer it, to come up with a better act of politics for it, uh, we don't have it. I think as Jeff said quite well, we have these 21st century technologies that we're trying to govern with 18th century political language. Uh, and this, the mismatch is causing tremendous friction, violence, uh, and anything that's possible. So first, very quickly, what happened to this whole order? What do we call this, this kind of you know, an order, uh, uh, a, a geopolitical mechanism, uh, structure? Carl Schmitt, who's a famous, infamous um, German political theorist, has a word that he calls uses to describe what, what these orders, what how these orders are. He's called nomos, N-O-M-O-S. A nomos, it's a, it's a whole platform. A nomos is the first primordial act of partition, the first logic of partition of how it is we would divide up or subdivide the world into sovereignty. So, for example, the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia is practically a key moment in the stabilization of the nation state as a basic generic model for how it is that uh, soccer affected itself. Westphalia, you think of the Mercator mountain again. You subdivide the land, not the ocean, not the air, not the electromagnetic spectrum, just the land. This is the first logic of subdivision. And in doing so, um, it produces uh, a particular kind of order. And again, there's very different ways of subdividing this. There's the border between the United States and Mexico and San Diego. You see that the fence goes just into the ocean to the point to which you can begin to argue that it's still land, um, at which point it goes away. We do subdivide the electromagnetic now in the form of uh, allocation of radio frequencies, for example. So there's any number of ways of, re of Westphalia, the, the modern political, geopolitical order that Benjamin was talking about, is one in which those subdivisions is essentially a loop topology. You can argue that before there's any regular, institutional, normal form of political geography, there's first a geometric logic for how it is to be structured. And the Westphalian model is essentially a loop topology. Some of those loops are square, like the sky, some of them are jagged like uh, California, some of them discontinuous like Hawaii, but it's essentially a loop structure by the way of the world. It's also, and this is crucially important for our discussion, flat. That the basic units of ge geographic geography are adjacent to one another. They don't superimpose upon one another. There is no z-axis for sovereign political geography according to the space. There is, however, in the real world, there are ways in which there are multiple sovereign claims on the same site, the same person, the same condition, layered on top of one another, stacked on top of one another. You don't ever resolve into any kind of consensual cosmopolitan uh, resolution, and yet there they are. So part of what we want to get a, a better grip on in this way is how it is that what we call planetary scale computation has been a driver in the destate, on the one hand, the destabilization of the earlier modern order, and perhaps more importantly, the production of, a, of, a, of another logic of territory that it produces in its own image. Now, the, this logic of territory that it produces in its own image is, as I, as I argue, one that is comprised of these thickened vertical uh, layers of, of, of sites on top of sites, claims on top of claims, uh, techniques on top of techniques. 
which we call the stack. Now, look very quickly. The, the idea of the stack that's proposed here is both a, uh, a kind of an image of a, of a, of a comprehensive uh, techno meta technology, what they call it accidental meta structure and the institutional or legal form by which that technology uh, instantiates its governance of the world. It is both a machine as an institution and an institution as a machine. It is both the mechanism that, that, uh, that, that organizes this world, this vast uh, infrastructure, united structure, and the nomos, the nomic logic of how it is that our sovereign space will be divided up at the same time. Um, uh, now, um, as the technology, as the words of the technology, the premise is that instead of thinking about all these various kinds of planetary scale computation, smart grids, Jeff talked about cloud computing, Internet of Things, augmented reality interface systems, so forth and so on, as a bunch of different kinds or species of computing all working on their own uh, and, and disconnected from one another. They actually form something like an integrated and modular software and hardware stack. They add up to something. There is a meta-machine logic to the way in which they work, which is not surprising because that's how complex software and hardware systems that we rely upon, such as the internet, were also designed. The model of the stack is the model of the planetary scale computation that, 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 that we have set in motion deliberately, it's also the model for the, that which is the megastructure that we have produced accidentally. And again, it's also the, the same time that institutional model of the way in which we would we were to show up. It is the, the political geographic model. So, very quick computer science 101 lesson. This is the OSI uh, software uh, network, network step. Key features of this to understand is that you have this separated modular layers. At each layer, there's a specific technology that does one specific thing and nothing else. That technology is described by the stack protocol in terms of what it does, not what it's made out of. And so anything can go into any one of those layers. And as long as that thing is able to talk to the layer above it and the layer below it, it can be made out of whatever you want it to be made out of. And this is the idea. So, the beginning of the internet, when mostly it's twisted pair of copper wires that's connecting everything, you can pull those out of the physical layer and replace them with fiber optics, as long as those fiber optics communicate with the, with the data link layer above it, according to that interface protocol, everything's fine. So it's this modular recombinacy of this mechanism that allows it to evolve, allows it to grow, and allows it to adapt. It's a bit like a, you were talking this morning, of a Theseus paradox, which you probably probably the George Washington's axe. This is the original axe that we chopped down the cherry tree with. We had to replace the handle four times and the head three times when it occupies the same space. Uh, the stack is an infrastructure that is designed to ultimately be replaced component by component and to still be, uh, uh, to still persist uh, in this regard. It's also, to a certain extent, we'll get to the end the optimistic side of the story, and that stacks are designed to be replaced. And so uh, the description we have of the stack we have, uh, the life we live now with the stack we have is only a precursor to the design and engineering of the stack to come. Okay. Um, one thing we also mentioned this morning is worth looking about in terms of the political theory behind this, and maybe one of the things that, that an attention to the affordances of this, belief, to the, this technology can tell us that it's counterintuitive about the way that think about the, uh, the design of political systems. One of the key ideas of, of Rem's delirious new art and maybe a sort of idiosyncratic reading of this is the importance of the grid. And the grid in the city is an absolutely arbitrary, autocratic, inflexible, even dumb topographic superimposition onto a space. But one of the things that it does, in addition to create these individuated cells, is it produces this the sectional logic of the skyscraper within each one of these cells. And within that sectional logic of the skyscraper, you can have a tremendous programmatic energy. There's a funeral parlor, funeral parlor on one floor, insurance company on another floor, shark tank, hairdresser, whatever. It can be all mixed together. And this and this 
the prom programmatic promiscuity uh, and invention this, this allows for it is the result of that initial autocratic superimposition. So as opposed to, say, you know, the logic of uh, you know, Occupy or something, where we need to produce a, a non-hierarchical democracy of means at this scale, which will somehow isomorphically be replicated at a larger scale, that our democracy of means will lead to a democracy of ends. Not only is that not guaranteed, but by attention to the logic of platforms at the scale of the city, and the logic of platforms at the scale of information computing technology, we may conclude the opposite, that in fact it's an arbitrary autocratic superimposition that more likely guarantees the heterogeneous, the heterological, uh, 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 democratic, non-hierarchical flow of, of, of information on, on the other hand. This is counterintuitive, kind of but it's part of the politics of platforms. And the key argument of the book is that is the importance of platforms. Platforms, I think, need to be understood not just as a particular model for service and product provision. They're an institutional and technical model as important as states and markets. States, we understand the role of the individual and the rights and responsibilities of the citizen. Markets, we understand that you know, we have effective models for homo economic rights and consumer. The analog for platforms is the user. We don't have particularly good geopolitical models of the user. And, when, and it's not serving as well. Part of the, the initial uh, paroxysms uh, by which we, uh, the spasms by which we try to articulate the politics of the user are like what Jeff discussed in uh, WikiLeaks and Snowden and the rest of us. A kind of closing off, privatization of this, of, of the, of this self. Absolute, uh, uh, absolute. Uh, anonymity for me and absolute transparency for its institutions. It doesn't stay. Right. I want to look very quickly through the next act because the bulk of this is really about the city layer, and particularly around the way in which the staff as a whole expresses itself in the city layer. And, and, and among the ways in which it does this is through uh, megastructure. The first layer that we're talking about is the earth layer. And one of the key ideas that, that the earth layer is that is the importance, is as far as the, the staff is concerned, of a computational panoptic surveillance of oil, water, carbon resources, and the development over the last 30 years of global app sensing apparatuses to try to quantify and measure natural resources, which um, are increasingly dwindling and increasingly becoming like a kind of reserve currency. The iron, the, one of the ironic things about the construction of this surveillance apparatus is that, as Jeff also mentioned, the, the infrastructure of planetary scale computation is incredibly energy intensive. The data center industry much far surpasses the carbon footprint of the airline industry for several years. The other side is that, in, in principle, if we had information computer technology deeply embedded into a building, construction, supply chain, logistics systems, that the efficiencies that it would provide for would, as some argue, be several orders of magnitude greater than the inefficiencies of consumption that it allows for. However, it's a strange part. Um, I was on a panel several years ago actually with a, a guy at HP who was a computer scientist, a uh, chip designer, uh, and system designer there. And he was on a, he was talking, he was on a panel of uh, invitation of then Vice President Al Gore to, the assignment that the group put these people together was, could you design, architect a computer system that could model the entire climate in real time? Well, in real time climate modeling computation, what would it take to do? Please go to one. So, one of the, of the conclusions that they came up with was that it would take, um, petabyte computation, the orders of which is you know, a couple orders of magnitude beyond the fastest supercomputers we have today, and its energy appetite would be, it would be uh, uh, incredible. Even by contemporary computer computational design standards, their conclusion was that a computer that would be able to be modeled the entire time in real time would be roughly the size of Paris, and would itself be the single most significant energy event that in itself would be modeled. And it's this recursion, I think, the hopelessness, the hopeless recursion here, that is part of the uh, Ouroboros snaking in its own tail paradox of the 
of the earth layer. The cloud layer uh, is where, in many cases, the most recognizable forms of authority and governance take place. One of the key arguments of the book is that global cloud platforms are increasingly taking over traditional functions and services of the modern nation state. Identity, cartography, currency, uh, and, and, and so forth. And that, as such, without any legislative machinations, cloud platforms uh, are, in, in many ways, as, as powerful in the way in which they organize the real governance of our lives, uh, the construction of us as users of their platforms, as a state. And that they do so in ways that are not necessarily just replicating the logics of the shape of the state. In, in the Google-China conflict, is exemplary of this in many ways. You were familiar with the last five years or so, Google uh, trying to hack Google servers, Google pulled out of the largest internet company in the world, essentially pulled out of the largest internet economy in the world, uh, though Android is still a big operating system there. But the, I think the, the key idea is not just that you have this conflict between two kinds of, uh, of, of geopolitical, of, of, of Chinese in, in America, real quality kind of state actors but a conflict over two different geometries and geographies of what constitutes uh, a sovereign political space in the first place, and who has rights to govern it. The Chinese model, the great firewall center model, is that there's a territorial contiguity, you can draw a moat around it, and you pinch all of the lines, possible channels coming in, and you have to filter those things, and you have a central command and control of all of the packets that happen on this plot of land. The model of the Google Cloud Polis is one that has a very different kind of geography. It's much more distributed. Uh, its, its governing mechanisms are much more, are, are believe, are, believe are much more decentralized. Uh, the rights and responsibilities of the user are much, much different. And they both overlap. You know, in any, pl any place in, in China, with access to Google and any functional sort of sense, you are being interpolated, in, as the, the technical term, you have to be counted as a sovereign unit of both systems at the same time. Both have both China and Google can claim a total command of the layer, if you like, of uh, of the of the geography over which they have dominion. And both of these layers exist at the same place at the same time. You you or any site participate in it at once, and it's this overlaying of multiple claims at the same place at the same time. That, of course, this has existed before and other kinds of things, but the fact that this, in many ways, is no longer an exception, but the normative structure of the, of the way in which uh, sovereignty is constructed and construed through our, people, through our, our, our tech, tech, uh, geopolitical technologies is new and novel and something we need to have a and much better understand. An example of this flip between the, the role of the state and the, and the cloud. It was a nice example of a few years ago where someone at Google Maps and Mountain View inadvertently or not uh, shifted the border to Nicaragua and Costa Rica on Google Maps. And Nicaragua mobilized its troops and took the land of Costa Rica that Google had bequeathed uh, it. So you think of this in comparison to, say, you know, Lewis and Clark and these, these sort of the ways that are in, you know, the Roman map makers describing the land over which governance would happen and on top of which civil society would work, as long as there's a, 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 a fundamental service that saves the law. That these get flipped in the stack, so to speak, and that the cloud platform is describing the reality of, of, of political cartography two states is a generally novel development. Now, one thing I want to make clear in terms of this morning, sometimes this, this, this might work on the cloud, nomos of the cloud is somewhat misinterpreted. The argument is not just that states, is, is that cloud platforms are somehow replacing states and that this is another story about globalization liquefying nation state. On the contrary, just as equal, equally so, as cloud platforms take on the, the, the functions and roles and responsibilities and services of states, the inverse is also true. States evolve into cloud platforms. We saw this with NSA, we see this with Google, and with, with Snowden and the rest. 
And then, uh, uh, you know, one argument might go that states, over time, always evolve in relationship to what it is that they can see. James Scott Scott will see on the state. As new, as new technologies, as new contexts, as new possibilities allow states to observe and to see new things that evolve in that shape. The cloud allows states to see things they previously have not done. It shouldn't surprise us that, that they would grow into that, into that infrastructure. The stipulator, which I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, in more detail, is one in which the, the, uh, the stack is made real at the scale of human habitat. Um, one of the, uh, and I'm going to skip over this for certain and come back to it. One of the uh, peculiar things, and I try to talk about the accidents that happen in each layer, one of the peculiar things that happens at the city layer is in the construction of the user as a kind of sovereign, uh, like as a new kind of sovereign, sovereign unit, is that it produces forms of, forms of sovereignty that are extra legal, that are uh, accidental. Uh, and that are not necessarily planned or guaranteed by uh, the state. The example that I like to uh, use to talk about this was a project that some colleagues of mine at UCSD did called the Trans Border Immigrant Tool, which, like it sounds, is a, is a cell phone app that would allow those who were migrating across the Sonoran and Mojave Deserts from Mexico into the United States to, to locate places where other groups, good Samaritan groups, had left freshwater caches out in the desert. Dozens of people die every year for making trip. So what this app essentially would do is allow you, is allow this, this might potentially be walking in other direction as well, um, to find these, these water caches. And for, as you might be surprised, the local Tea Party congressmen weren't particularly enthusiastic about this use of the public university funds to provide this as well. And at a certain extent, they, I think they arguably did understand what was so disruptive about this law. The interface doesn't care whether you're legal or not. The apparatus that is constructing and, and constructing and making this 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 space available to you as you move across it doesn't care if you're uh, if you are a state-sanctioned person or not. Just like a freeway doesn't care if you are a state-sanctioned person or a water pump or a sidewalk. The interfaces that I get through at, at, at an urban level also are agnostic as to some of these legal statuses, and of course they can also be used for other purposes of control. But in and of themselves, they provide an access to the scope of, 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 of infrastructure um, that is beyond the control. There's much more to be said about that. Well, one point, let me get to this as well, because this issue is kind of important. Um, these, the partitions that constitute the city, all of the walls, the barriers, the, the, uh, the membrane, the subdivide inside and the outside, has been as part of the way in which the, uh, the, 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 the governance of that space is, has, is, 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 is instantiated itself. And in one of the ways in which this idea of the nomos has been uh, discussed in terms of architecture is in the work of Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher. Agamben talks about what's supposed to keep the camp, it means literally the concentration camp, as the nomos of the modern. That is, it's the ur architectural logic of, of the modern. And there's long reasons why this has to do, largely to do with the ability of the sovereign to decide the terms of exception. What does that mean? It means the ability to declare the state of emergency within a situation. Agamben's argument is that uh, the sovereignty is not, does not sit with the whatever or whatever controls the normal development, though in everyday goes on of, 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 the, of, of, of a political space. It's, it's he who can declare a state of emergency. Just say that the normal rules now do not apply. And in the state of emergency, there is no limit to the force that can be applied to the situation. The camp, the concentration camp, in the 1930s, was an extra juridical construction. They were not legal in any technical sense. They were, they were produced as a kind of uh, protective custody, was the actual was the, uh, justification. And then later were <coughs> normalized and made into uh, a, 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 a legal structure. Now, 
who's off. And there's another argument that we'll try to quickly summarize here about the importance not just of the camp, but of the enclave. We mentioned this today. The enclave is, can be seen as the inversion of the camp. The, the camp is the place in which, through the, through the, the, rec, the uh, alibi of the emergency of the exception, something is quarantined, is kept inside. The enclave, which is the same structural form, is the, is the space in which you go into <coughs> in order to keep the, uh, uh, to contain the contaminant effect. But the real exception, and this is, we can we discuss this in a the real exception is not only the moment you decide when there is a state of, state of emergency such that these extra-juridical ones can be deployed. In the exception within the exception, if you like, is the decision over whether or not that wall is keeping you in or keeping you out. Whether or not this form is an enclave or whether this form is a camp. Now, there's another argument about why the interface of the urban layer is the oscillation of this as well. But the basic principles of uh, exemplified with this picture here. Has anyone ever seen this before? This picture? Okay. In the early 1990s, late 1980s, there was a civil war, what used to be Yugoslavia, a tremendously brutal uh, interreligious interethnic war that was for the most part ignored throughout the war. It was another case of people with unpronounceable names doing unspeakable things on unfathomable reasons. And then this picture was uh, published around the event. It went around the world and instant, instantly mobilized public opinion against the public opinion against the war and largely demanded ultimately the the NATO, the NATO interventions. It's a picture of Bosnian Muslim prisoners behind barbed wire in a Serbian concentration camp. The image of a concentration camp from Central Europe again, 50 years or so after World War II, uh, is what mobilized this opinion against the war. This was an intolerable, uh, intolerable condition. Now, what's interesting is that the Serbs when confronted with this, with the, the enormous, the instantaneous global uh, concern over what they had been doing for several times, the reply was, no, 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 you have this all backwards. It's not that these people are inside the camp, and the photographer came up was looking at the, at the fence and taking a picture of them on the inside. The photographer was inside the camp, and the curious prisoners were walking on the outside, <coughs> looking in at him while he took, while he took the picture. And so this camp versus enclave dynamic was itself was going to question. Eventually there was a trial in Britain and the rest of it, and it was decided by the British legal authorities that this was in fact a camp, that this side was the inside, that that side was the outside. Of this side. Okay. Um, IP addresses. How many of you know what it, tell me very briefly what an IP address is. If asked, I'm not going to ask you what an IP address is. Because you have some idea what it's like. Anything that's connected to the internet needs to have, is able to connect to the internet because it has an address. Only because it has an address does it have a position from which it can send and receive information. Like the address of a building allows it to send and receive parcels from any other building in the world because it has this address system. Any address in space has a theoretical limit to the amount of addresses that it can contain. The United States zip code is you know, 10,000 addresses. You can, 99,999 plus 1 is the zero. The, to date, the entire internet has been based off of IP version 4 addressing space. Uh, this is a map we made of the current IP version 4 addressing space. And one of the things that you'll note with this map is that every quadrant has already been allocated. We are, in essence, running, we have, in essence, for functional purposes, run out of internet addresses. Not that they weren't all being used at this moment, because there's all kinds of techniques for swapping them very quickly. You log on to your internet right now and scroll down only to one address, and then later you might get another to log out to the top swap. But this isn't scalable. These are these regional internet registries that allocate these addresses. And within the IP version 4 space, there's only about three, I think it's about four billion possible addresses, a little bit less than that, three point seven billion possible addresses. And for just 7 billion people in the world, it's less than one per person. So for a, the, a, a real ubiquitous computing internet things kind of scenario where you have everything you have to 
car shop or your appliances up in your house or whatever, everything talking to everything else, less than one additional person does a point. So the solution to this is to propose is um, IP version 6. This, by the way, is the address layer. IP version 6. So you, you ask, what is the address space of IP version 6? IP version 6 is a 128-bit address string. 128-bit address string. Now, so you subdivide the theoretical address space in 128 address string by 7 million people, and you get roughly 10 to the 23, 10 to the X, you know, X to the 23 per person. 10 to the 23 address per person. So this is you know, inconceivably vast number. This is roughly the number of grains of sand on the planet. If you wanted to assign an IP address to every single thing you ever came in contact with over the course of your entire life, every pen, every piece of lettuce, every uh, disused napkin you found on the chair before you sat down, you could never you could never use 10 to the 23 addresses. It's not just the, the objects at the anthropometric scale, or it's more like the the molecules in the ink on every piece of paper you ever come in contact with. Now, at the same time, though, you can you not only can address things that we take to be things at a kind of you know binocular vision, prehensile thumb, primate scale of an object. You can also, in principle, address relations between things. And this is an important part of any kind of logistic structure, supply chain model, because address not only objects themselves, things and being, but relations. So the fact, so your pen can have an address, but the fact, this immaterial mass of this fact that has no weight, that the fact that it is your pen can also have an address. The, the, the source of the petroleum that went into the plastic can have an address. The, the pieces of paper that it touched, not only in another thing, but the fact that there was a relation between these things could have an address. And so the relations of relations of relations of relations, which turtles all the way down, into the abyss of relations and relations can become exponentially more complex. So, such that you could never, such that, that some of us mean never being able to allocate, you could allocate all your addresses almost instantaneously if you wanted to actually address all the relations and relations. So, in other words, some of them never and instantaneously uh, is the design space of this uh, ad address. But as we think about, let's say, the site condition, the landscape of real ubiquitous computing, it's important, I think, it's crucial that we think of it not just as a model of the Internet of Things as we want to take it to be, but rather of, of the addressable, uh, addressable contingency, the addressable relations and, and correlations and causality that may in fact provide to those things, may in fact make the, the, uh, the momentary, their momentary assemblage even possible to do. Okay. Interfaces. Graphical user, there's an interface that I define as any complex, is a company that has any point of contact between two complex systems, which as that point of contact governs the condition of exchange between the two. <coughs> so a button with words on it that you click is an interface. But a steering wheel is also an interface to a car. Car is an interface to a city, a national borders, the international borders are interface between two jurisdictions. Graphical user interfaces that we are sort of the dominant mode of the interface that we that we uh, construe today are, are a particular genre of this, and an interesting one in the sense. The argument that I one of the arguments that I mentioned is that we need to understand the interface in terms of the history of the diagram. Charles Sanders Paris the diagram is one of the the fourth mode of the sign. Icon, index, symbol, diagram. This you may have seen before as the most famous diagram of Napoleon's march from Paris into Moscow. There's about seven or eight different things that are being modeled in this diagram at once. One of the key, though, the most obvious is that on the left, that thick orange wedge, the left represents Paris, on the right, to the top right is Moscow. The orange wedge represents the number of troops who left Paris as they made their way across Russia in the winter to Moscow. The black line represents the number who made it back to Paris after the war. A diagram as a form of communication is 
an abstract mechanism that condenses all kinds of complex events, processes, procedures, and relations into, uh, into, uh, into, into forms of geometric abstraction that allow us to deduce them and interpret them uh, in a way that's extraordinarily compressed. It's a form of data compression. It's the same data compression that you have in the font. It's one that you need visually. There's an incredible complexity that is summarized into this image that we can see. Graphical user interfaces are a kind of diagram in that they allow us to have an image, a total image of all of the possibilities that the system may allow us to work with. All of the things you can see on your screen that, was, that, that you can do with this machine and that would work. But unlike a graphical diagram that does that same thing, the graphical user interface as a, as a kind of diagram is one in which if you manipulate the image of the thing in relation to that that's being represented, you can affect the thing that's being represented. In other words, that chain of representation between the event that is compressed and abstracted into the diagram is now instrumentalized, such that if you manipulate that diagram, you click the button, it says more water going into Ontario, which is what this is from, you in fact will cause that thing to happen in the world. Now, as, a, as a genre of technology, this is extraordinary. We don't have the history of images, the history of visual history of, of our visual culture is, has, is not one in which the pictures that we make of, of things. Uh, that if you somehow manipulate the picture of the thing, you will cause that thing to happen. You would uh, do a portrait of someone, or a, a capture of that. If you were to click on this picture of it, you don't cause that thing to happen. And yet, this is what, this is the form of, 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 you know, vision, of the visual technology that interfaces have provided, have provided to us. One helps you click on the printing, and somehow printing happens in the world. And also, then, in the history of technology, we have the novelty by which Instead of a mechanical system which works upon molecules in a direct, in a direct kind of fashion, or knobs that somehow abstract that relationship over, 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 a, uh, over some distance, distance and relay, we, we are, have learned to create an environment, a technical environment around us, in which we manage and manipulate that environment according to pictures of the effects that we want to have happen. We learn to do this because we have we developed a kind of literacy in the, in the particular generation of vernaculars of graphical user interfaces, which is as arbitrary and as, as, and, and, and as regular as those of any other kind of uh, visual syntactical syntax system. The danger, however, is that we may confuse in a way the way in which this interface summarizes the world with the way in which the world actually is. Now, when we're talking about graphical user interfaces, so forth, the buttons on the screen is a little bit less you know, to keep this interpreting distance to bed. But with contemporary emerging interface technologies such as augmented reality, which is a general set of technologies by which the interfacial elements that you might perceive are, are directly superimposed upon what you perceive in the world. So instead of giving a picture of something in the world that when manipulated causes it happens somewhere else, that representation is glued onto, is, is uh, subtitles the actual object of the yeah. My fear, ultimately, is that this collapse of a, of a, a, a referential distance between the, the image that describes the event and the thing in the world that actually is being perceived is a recipe for a kind of cognitive fundamentalism by which the necessary interpreted work of anamnesis in religion, that this is a good thing or a bad thing, this is our thing, this is their thing. When those commands are, are, are super, that this is an okay thing to eat, but that's a not okay thing to eat, that that's a, a friend, but that's an enemy, that when these interpretations are literally glued onto what you see, subtitled in direct perceptual reality, that what we call today fundamentalism um, 
almost inevitably, it seems to me, becomes a dominant culture of the, this form of, of interfacial regime. And I don't only mean the Abrahamic monotheisms that we know today, which will certainly rush into the space, but other kinds of fundamentals that become as well. All right. How are we on time, by the way? And, you know, we're good? Ten more minutes. Let me skip this part. Um, <laughs> now that humans are a majority of living species, it's time to reevaluate. Uh, what real final instant sovereignties can be derived from the city or all city surface and interface. To do so, as I argue, uh, means to situate the city as an independent layer uh, within the stack and to turn uh, the management and networks uh, of those urban networks within uh, a context of global information uh, and energy cloud. Uh, that layer uh, is not one that is uh, encapsulated by the legal boundaries but as I argue, spread throughout a kind of composite global city for which any one metropolis is a localized instance of global economies of mobilization and partition. Um, the stack, I mean, another way in which um, this, you know, we can see that, is that as the stack operates between different cities uh, at, at, within the countries of side of different cities, there's also the possibility of a different kind of city-to-city -city warfare in the past. An example of this that we have to work with is the Stuxnet. This is virus that sent to the United States and Israel uh, engineered to attack the Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, the amazing thing about this piece of code, for those of you who are familiar with it, it was, was a whole story about how it actually got into the nuclear facilities. It was amazing. We really need to try to a little bit more about it. What it does is it causes these centrifuges within the, 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 uh, uh, within the, the, the core of the reactor to wobble just slightly, and they don't really work right, and yet report themselves as working just fine. Uh, and this causes the Iranians to know the headaches is going forward, the going forward as well. And it's this kind of, um, uh, kind of paras parasitic code that, that in many ways will like, define the city-to-city -city warfare uh, at the level of the level of the stack. A little bit like the um, uh, cordyceps unilateris, which is a, a, a fungus that grows inside, infects the brain of the species of ants, and directs the zombie ant to crawl to the precise height in the jungle canopy, suitable by temperature and humidity to the fungus to fully spore, and where the ant husk becomes a factory for production of more, of more fungus. This is also the biopolitics of software, uh, as we see with things like um, with uh, uh, Stuxnet. Okay. Um, the other thing I'm trying to get through the key uh, here quickly is the um, the development of the megastructure. Remember, the megastructure is really the key uh, typology of of, uh, of urbanism at stack scale, and the development. The, Buildings that, that operate um, at that uh, at that stack, stack scale, um, and on the one hand, like the uh, withdrawn camp um, that we saw that we saw a bit before, the megastructures are also a way of trying to encapsulate the entire world inside of, the, of an entire envelope. They're inevitably a kind of utopian model, that by which the totality of all operations can somehow be contained by any particular program. Um, but as we'll see, like the Sith from Star Wars, megastructures always come in pairs. And, they're, uh, and the, 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 the contiguity and privacy of their withdrawal uh, is never, uh, can never escape uh, that local, those local damage. All right. For the moment, um, for the moment, we can argue that one, one could argue, I don't want to that, that parametricism and other kinds of related programs have won one circumscribed kind of battle to represent early 20th century super, contempor super contemporary style for our, our airport cities. 
But architecture in general has badly lost the war for the design of urban space. And these two accomplishments are, I think, at least correlated. Instead of design studios, it's management consultants like McKinsey, Morgan Stanley, Halliburton, Cisco, Siemens, IBM, that are winning the city making game. And they have rather different design interests in the flows of algorithmic capital and the spastic valuations of land, energy, information, and human capital. They too can be said to render the city layer as an imprint of the layers above and the layers below. And they possess equally deliberative mechanisms to structure urban systems accordingly. Their topological imaginary, however, is not, folded, is not the folded surface, but the calculator grid. And any disinterested alien intelligence would observe that today the most efficacious <coughs> parametric urban design software is Microsoft Excel. In effect, management of all the ship over urban form as new built space becomes a form finding byproduct of speculative space use in site cost simulations. Their methods pull data driven design from deeper strata, the stack telescoping descriptive and prescriptive algorithms set in motion with the cloud layer and building their local franchises into urban or urban-ish investors. Their spatial systems, their spatial systems economics often outpace legal codification, leveraging arbitrage and gaps in formal building code and zoning um, and so forth. Their portfolio can be measured in millions of square kilometers. But it seems that the quantity of officially futuristic cities is inversely proportional to the quality of their futurism. New totalistic, not really totalitarian, smart cities initiatives from global IT companies have borne real fruit for those offering them often find the clients in sovereign capital funds or sovereign government or sovereign governance or governance directly. They are also in no way allergic to collaboration or subcontracting to globally known architectural design. And so this mix of real architects and urbanists with IT systems architects and administrators is neither intrinsically offensive nor automatically fortunate, but it does alter the relative tabula rasa on which synthetic megacities are built. No more Brasilia or, uh, or Tsukuba, Science City. Now we have variations on J.G. Ballard, Supercon, <coughs> Mazdar, Foster Partners, Skolkova, Cisco, Songdo City, Cisco, IBM, and, and, and everyone else. The King of Dublin, <coughs> Science and Technology, H IBM, HOK, and on and on. These moon bases on Earth are spliced from Soviet science cities, Silicon Valley campuses, Orange County gated communities, and a tactical mutual understanding between political despotism and technological innovation. They are what cities look like in the shadow of airports, special economic zones, and sustainability mandates. Some of these would redefine city states as carefully policed service platforms, and for their urban planning expertise, the reliance is on CRM, DRM, server virtualization, end user usage metrics, object synchronization across multiple devices, and device synchronization across multiple data objects, and so on, at least as much as it does in architectural design. And not at all, and often not at all on the on things that are normally thought to make interesting cities interesting. These metropoli, these cities are post-interesting which is itself interesting. The contrary to parametricism's figure of virtuosity, real form is subordinated to building forms that are recognizable and ad hoc, popular and stupid, but amenable to the real estate metrics that outvote other politics of the envelope. Partial list of these benchmarks includes both the sensible and the sinister <coughs> on-site carbon footprint minimization, energy and water management, replaceable and recombinant building materials, perimeter gate security, civic control contingency planning, bomb resistant membranes, crowd circulation administration, tightly curtailed digital signage, assigned parking spaces, account credit issuing recycling bins for some, and for others, separate public entrances for citizens, women, 
unclean animals and service staff. I wanted to, two things I wanted to, uh, before we go to a Q and A, and that is the relationship between these mega structures and the, and the experimental work of what we might have taken to be more utopian architectures of an earlier era. The composite megastructural form of the city layer of the stack, that is the composite both of the of interweaving of physical and informational infrastructures, um, is in some ways can be seen perhaps uh, counterintuitively as a realization of certain Apollo era architectural mega utopia, mega utopias. A total envelope, a universal interfacial grids, superimposition of quasi sovereign laws, and so forth. We see aspects of these earlier utopian projects in the city layer today and recognize their evil doppelgangers as well. So, for example, so we have to equate the uh, uh, voluntary, the voluntary uh, prisoners of architecture is mirrored in a different way in, in Foxconn, the largest employer in all of China, which assembles much of the human scale digital electronics equipment that connects urban society to the staff. Foxconn's largest factories, um, uh, the long, longest one is, is, is in uh, Longwa and Shenzhen, situates an estimate, estimated 400,000 employees slash residents in a massive live work complex. It's a megastructure both by sheer architectural scale and by social totalization. And so one could also say that Foxconn is an island and therefore prone to utopian and has been more the case dystopian imaginations. So along the spectrum of platform openness versus platform closure, Foxconn's regimented cycle of life passing from one phase to another, perhaps until death, places it at the end of a dotted line through voluntary prisoners to the present, each the prototype for the other. Its factory floor is responsible for the physical assembly of, of the things we bring with us, our laptops, our phones, which are themselves essential interfaces between users in motion and the landscapes of the stack. And in this regard, it is also a kind of savage realization of Arthur Graham's plug-in city, computer city, 1968 and 1966, respectively. Similarly, we see Super Studios continuous mining realized in global crossings, massive deployment of transoceanic fiber optics during the dot com frenzy of the late 1990s. Super Studios was successful as a project, but unbuilt. The telecoms was built, but busted its investors. We can measure no stop city and the compulsive speed of ambulatory urban computing in the interfacial city without beginning. And for middle. We imagine Cedric Price's fun palace turned inside out by North Korean stadium pageants, where the audience itself is the media content. But instead of free to play, each actor is instead rendered into a disciplined pixel within a larger choreography of the spectacular image. We could mark an ancestral trace from Jonah Friedman's Love Is Special, the new Asian smart cities such as New Songdo City. Quote, new ubiquitous city, says the brochure, South Korean Kichiyama development. Or see Palo Solari's arcology as a first pass on Mastar, that massive green city in Abu Dhabi. Incidentally, both Songdo and Mastar were built uh, by Cisco and IBM. Is the situation's cut and paste psychogeography reborn or smashed to bits by Minecraft? What binds the hyper-libertarian secessionism of the Seasteading Institute, which would move whole populations offshore to live on massive floating ships, floating from port to port, unmolested by regulation and undesired publics? Peter Thiel, Facebook founder, so this is a key sponsor under Seasteading, by the way. Do we, what binds Seasteading then to our programs? Walking City, Project 1967, which plotted for Star Wars like landwalkers, like city machines to get up and amble away to greener pastures as needed. For that matter, as models of programmable planets and embryonic mustrioka brains, how should we weigh Cisco and NASA's planetary skin, which, which would blanket the globe's epidermal crust with ubiquitous physical sensors on the one hand, and 
the Death Star on the other. Because as any Death Star, as any Star Wars nerd can tell you, for the Death Star, like for the animal brain itself, the most important information processing and mission critical tasks take place on the outer surface of the sphere, on the skin, not on the core. So Death Star, planetary skin, Palm Jeremiah, Techland's Tower, the USS Enterprise, the Pentagon, Noah's Ark, Flat Sand, New South China Mall, Rungyong Hotel, Shangji Pod Village, Sim City, Irvine. It gets harder to keep all of the walled mega gardens straight. Um, I want to, I know we're pressed for time, I want to, though, let me skip ahead to this section. This is a discussion of Norman Foster's work, who I take to be. And discuss a bit as the preeminent architect of the Google Earth era, um, his work in relationship to uh, the project he was commissioned to do to, to, to develop buildings on the moon by the European Space Agency, the 3D print architecture uh, on the moon. Um, this is Crystal Island um, uh, proposal for in Moscow, which not not built after the, the financial crisis. Of, Tens of thousands of people were to live in this uh, twisted pair, uh, upside down flower base mega structure, mega, mega city uh, of sorts. And so it was not built, as I said, if it had, it could have taken its place alongside the Tsar Bomba, the largest 50 megaton bomb, or the Antonov 225. Russians have this great collection of unnecessarily large um, uh, design objects. You win the win the win that uh, often win that race. Okay. Um, so it's in this context that we want to then look at how it is the cloud platforms themselves choose to imprint and instantiate and symbolize themselves through architecture at the level of the city. And recently, they've been doing a lot of building. We can co compare this work for organizational architecture to, for example, the Chrysler building, 42nd in Lexington, designed by William and Allen for Mr. Chrysler himself in the 1920s, as perhaps an exemplary of an older, continuous, and self contained organizational body. The preponderance of the company's executive staff cohabitated the vertical castle summoned into a singular internalized corporate hierarchy modeled in the stacked floors and rigid posture of the tower. In his ponderous film, Cremaster III, Matthew Barney takes on the construction of the Chrysler Building as an occult epicenter of bygone symbolic economies of industrial power, old money, and organic class hierarchy. The conspiratorial conflict involves the architect and the entered apprentice and some other stuff related to Masonic lore and the grand eloquent capacity of deep wealth. Now, in considering, for example, Googleplex in Mountain View, um, or the proposed new Apple headquarters in Cupertino, you might well wonder and shudder if some future Matthew Martin will dance through the hallways with similarly reverent obsequiousness. Do the old and new headquarters even traffic with the same denominations of spirit and cash? The answer leads mostly to other questions. And we'll then we take a look at Few of these sort of the, a bit of an architectural phrenology by which we read these platforms in terms of their architecture. In the Plex, Google's footprints seem less determined by architectural innovation than by the nuts and bolts combination of an elite idealized corporate elective community. Prioritized over new style is the compound's performance as a support system for the peak cognitive labor that is staged there. Instead of being stationed with magisterial art deco appointments, Googlers lunch together on artless furniture, but while they do, they enjoy a free and nutritious gourmet meals. Why fuss with decorative aesthetics when something far more, far more valuable is being hatched during the meal? Available onsite amenities include massage, free bikes, indoor rock climbing, and regular symposia with thought leaders on a range of topics. Efforts are made to couch an idealized version of programming lifestyle in its idiosyncratic luxuries to dampen any distraction or discomfort that might interrupt collaborative innovation, including perhaps going home. 
the Googleplex may already serve as a kind of model of suburban and spatial system for the maintenance of global software platforms, but for that it is a highly selective population of users. Unlike some utopian communities, Google's infamous and seemingly obtuse interview questions guarantee that the entrance to its rarefied colony is filtered according to demonstrable problem-solving acumen, creativity, and academic pedigree. We can say as well I think that, and Gary said himself, that the open, the open plan, uh, twisting, winding network um, one for the Facebook campus that he's designed is a kind of social graph given architectural form by which the possibility of encounter and uh, maintenance of your own uh, 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 social, con uh, social forms of contact through the pedestrian passive ways becomes the function of this particular architecture. Perhaps the boldest design statement, however, quote unquote, made by a cloud platform is Campus 2, Cupertino, as proposed by Apple and our Sir Foster during Steve Jobs last year. So when Jobs pitched the, uh, the plans to Cupertino City Council, which you can watch online, he neglected to mention with whom his, his, his vision had sought collaboration. Foster was in the mission. Plans show a giant toric spaceship, Jobs' own words, landed among apricot groves in an apparent pre-launch posture. The design harkens to Aero Cernan's Watson Research Center for IBM in 1961, and many mid-20th century suburban corporate exurban campuses. But instead of a set of buildings, Foster closed, closed ring fits an entire campus inside one curving arc. To many, it resembles an austere relative of Hertzong de Bruyne's Allianz Arena, as transplanted from Munich to a more bucolic home in California. Or better, a cult inspired interplanetary escape craft straight from the Michelle Welbeck novel. This vast, closed, iconic, infinite loop contains 2.8 million square feet of interior space but appears to have no face to the outside world, no real front, front or back, beginning or end. Perhaps this replicates the loop border of the Westphalian state or of the utopian island. Descriptions used in the proposal, like integrated, claim that it will, quote, create a physically unified community, rather, or, rather radically understate the insularity of this habitat, with its central plant, cavernous underground, and off-site parking, rump state. Once employees have made their way back to the surface from this, this subterranean, uh, automobile archipelago, they will look out and see only the trees for the forest. <coughs> Withdrawn into this island package, Apple citizens will enjoy the benefits and suffer the fragilities of the reserved enclave. Bunkers imply security, control, purification, impenetrability. The life of wall garden of iOS itself, you can also suffer from having to serve as both platform and content. As others have observed, in the distant sidewalks across the entrance roads, this sort of suburban walling off of a corporation's population may, less, may be less futuristic than a throwback to 1950s campuses. As opposed to the creative class um, uh, of strategies of urban contact and, and stimulation, Apple recedes and secedes into the control space of the curated megastructure. Total interiority is a disappearance of the outside for utopian platforms like Apple's price of curation is closure. Um, Foster's other commission, was, you know, Foster's other commission is to redesign all of the Apple stores. <coughs> Apple's uh, fund their embassies, their territorial presence, um, by which the idealized Apple users truthfully help you and explain everything that you might need to do to further uh, move your way along the platform catechism. Mm -hmm. With Foster's other commission, with the design of printed structures on the moon, as I say, should we see the Apple Cloud Polis as part of a collection of his megastructural interfaces? <coughs> it's Crystal Island, um, however, and per Crystal Island, is this design really properly suited to a post-Apollo objects of geographic scale? and the recognition of any projects to expand the planetary situation? Or is it a kind of arc building for paranoid withdrawal? 
designed to sustain life on a hostile alien planet, even if that planet is our own Anthropocene Earth. There are certainly many ways to characterize how uh, the megastructure works for the city layer um, and the, 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 the draw implications of moon race or something like Fuller's uh, dome of megacities. And in many cases, the very largest buildings in the world aren't designed for humans at all. They're there to accommodate um, and express the algorithmic resorting and distribution of inanimate objects. Um, the, the, the moving or bending across the, our, uh, these giant nodes and uh, logistical switching stations. We don't, for example, we don't reside in Foster's Beijing Airport. We simply pass through it. Most of the, like the objects that move through these, uh, these, uh, these, logistical, these logistical sites. And at the city layer, this object-oriented economy of molecular logistics is expressed in these planetary super services, like the services of the major way uh, uh, energy developer calls them. Warehouse is so large that their floors have been laser leveled against the curvature of the earth. So instead of walls or windows, these spaces are programmed by barcodes, RFID chips, scanners, populated by robotic platforms in one way or another. Now, take it as, excuse me, take it as a whole, these cloud platform megastructures concentrate the city layer, um, drawing the rich economies of flesh and information and energy civilization into a a web of settlement and displacement. It is uneven as it is asymmetrical. This was something I found in the Spiegel, the German newspaper, um, just a few weeks ago. I was surprised to learn that in one of the more recent uh, disclosures, which I highly recommend that you look through these, these things online, not just because you'll find out things that you somehow didn't know are actually true, but there are large PowerPoint files, and the PowerPoint design of the National Security Agency or is incredible in its own, in its own way. But I was surprised to learn um, that the NSA also sees the uh, planetary scale computation as a stack. This is their model for the development of, for, their, for the space in their operation. They have five, I have six, OSI has seven, but you know, almost got it right. Um, but I want to come back to this pair of megastructure. Often a megastructure will have a special interdependent relationship with another, such that its own enveloping closure belies dependence on the doppelganger. One perhaps uh, a, a, a continental way for its own energy, purpose, and support. For example, Apple's spaceship in Cupertino, where they designed the strategy that cannot possibly exist without the Foxconn factory extension, where Apple's products are assembled with parts into perfected slabs, which have their users to the cloud. Even as they are occupying different corners of the globe and remain selectively ignorant of what goes on on the other side. The two megastructures are intimately paired. They share a unique bond across strange distances of the city layer, binding them together in ways that penetrate total closure by doubling and mimicking the totality of one into the other. Foxconn's fences sit next to suicide. Foxconn's fences sit next to suicide nets as apples do to apricot fields. Foxconn's dorms occupy apples and subterranean parking. Foxconn's massive assembly lines tag along with Apple's consumer service training programs. Together, these megastructures, along with the network of mall-based retail embassies, constitute the territorial urban terrestrial urbanity of the Apple Cloud platform and the Apple Cloud polity. But their symbolic relationship may be fragile and or, and or unpleasant. Like the Eloy, the Morlock, and H.G. Wells' time machine, the megastructures, two paired populations, share the same world but inhabit different spaces. One above ground, the other underneath. One living in a perpetual instance of play and leisure, experience design and innovation, staying strategically distanced, oblivious or uninterested in how it all appears every morning for them. While the others run the machines underneath, toiling against the earth, forcing it to produce bounty over and over again. It's perhaps a bad omen for Cupertino that the bargain between the subterranean world of the Morlocks and the surface world of the Eloy is maintained only because the Morlocks 
periodically harvest Eloi by cattle and eat them. The lesson is that cannibal economies between networks and megastructures that the city layer of the state are not always what they first appear. So I want to close then with just one key point as we go as we enter the discussion. And that going back to the very first one I made is that this chat is a model, as a technical model, as a machine model, as an institutional model, as a geographic model is one that is designed to be replaced. That the stack we have is not the stack we will die with. The stack is designed to be turned into the stack to come. It always is. And so the design project, and I explicitly articulated in the book, we see the book as a design brief, is to compose that stack to come. And hopefully we have some handle on how to visualize the stack today and how it organizes generic problems up, up and down. We can model a baseline scenario, user citizens name and profile using some vanilla interface platform, connected to a stable mix of IP before and IP6 addresses, smart objects situated in a specific city, connected to a specific Wi-Fi jurisdiction, governed by the application layer of a specific global cloud platform, and drawing hydroelectric uh, energy or coal energy to power the whole thing. We can also imagine Another stack in which the user is an environmental sensor. The interface is a data reporting API. Addresses are assigned to individual threshold events as detected, all working in the city layer of a threatened rainforest as part of a transnational carbon risk reinsurance cloud platform and pulling low wattage energy from plentiful solar and chemical sources. We can draw another possible stack in which an assemblage of two robots, three delimited algorithms activated from afar. And three humans on three different continents constitute the composite user, linking them to the interface layer through a Shanghai news for the Android that translates between the five or six different quote languages at work. We can imagine them mapping and acting upon a specific culinary agricultural assemblage that has been addressed according to Bronze Age dietary conventions. Located in multiple, even hostile city states, accessing a mix of several public cloud applications as well as encrypted proprietary databases sucking of all of the above stew of utility electrons. Or an unnamed kid in a quasi-public 3D printing works in Lagos using two different open source additive manufacturing APIs, downloaded CAD scripts, and YouTube uploader for Windows to spoof the addresses of pirated bicycle cranks. They will now phone home and report that they are actually licensed and operational in Cape Town, which will really be used to haul bags of cement to the fourth floor of the building that shows up having only two floors in Google Earth real time at least when we're in South African APIs, South African APs, all running on the AfriNet versions of Google's no carrier the continent cloud, sucking energy from a Franco-Chinese nuclear plant on the shores of Lake Chad, and chewing up circuitry materials recycled from e-waste drawn lifts from Bosanova and CAR, courtesy of the All-African Defense Forces. And so it's easy to come up with the, these political science fiction scenarios, but it's hard to specify the shape of them, working in combination. If only because all of the layers in the scenarios above could just as easily be combined with any of the other layers. Take two to five from one, stir and simmer. So instead of neatly homogenous utopias or dystopias, it is the divergent mixtures that resist designation as they generate and draw on the energy loss of radiant waste materials of whatever is most distant or closest at hand, they may nevertheless be most crucial. So to close, I re reiterate, the structural logic of the stack system allows an replacement of whatever occupies one layer with something else. And for the rest of the architecture to continue to function without pause. The content of the earth, the city, the cloud, the address, the interface layer can and will be replaced, including the masochistic hysterical fiction of the individual user, both neoliberal and neoliberal other things, while the rest of the the rest of the armature remains viable, a viable global infrastructure. The stack is designed to remake, that is its technical form. But unlike the place of copper wire, fiber optics, the transmission layer, replacing one kind of user with another is more difficult. Today we're doing it by adding more and different kinds of things into the user position. We should, however, allow for more comprehensive displacements, not just by elevating things to the status, things to the status of political subjects, but by making way for genuinely ahuman and inhuman positions. Thank you.
now we can get it. We can take one or two questions here, and then we can go to the reception where people can ask additional questions. Does anyone have any questions here? Question maybe the wrong way. Cities 
are not just survival uh, mechanics and technology with the city. Yes. They are the production of these, they are the production of these uh, technologies that make the same images that evolve. Yes. And I'm watching in your discussion, which is my I don't want to say that this is, okay, listen to that. Yeah. I agree with you, Jeff. Yeah. 